Hello, I'm here on behalf of GoCognitive.net and I'm with Dr. Strayer of the University of Utah who specializes in attention and skill acquisition and a lot of whose research right now revolves around driver distraction and cell phone use and he's here to talk to us today about that. So I guess the big overarching question is uh, when I talk or when my friends talk on their cell phones while they're driving, are they putting themselves at risk or any other drivers at risk with this behavior? Um, yeah, they are. Um, we know that uh, from a lot of ways of studying driver distraction that when someone talks on a cell phone um, that they increase their crash risk. They're about four times more likely to be involved in an accident. Um, and the accidents that they're involved in tend to be a little bit more severe because um, they tend not to hit the brakes as, as quickly or uh, as aggressively as they should. Um, and just to kind of put that crash risk into perspective, um, when people are uh, drunk, they're uh, at a blood alcohol level of 0.08, their accident risk is uh, about four times higher than uh, if they weren't uh, impaired. So uh, um, in terms of kind of crash risk and an accident risk, um, someone who's talking on a cell phone is about as likely to be involved in an accident as someone who's drunk. Wow. That's, that's pretty scary. I mean, what about other distractions like, you know, talking with a passenger, listening to the radio? Do those have the same effect? Talking on a cell phone or dialing a cell phone um, are some of the highest uh, uh, levels of impairments that you typically see. So compared with, say, listening to a radio, if you listen to a radio broadcast and that's at normal volume, you don't get impairments. Um, if you talk to a passenger who's sitting right next to you, um, the overall crash risk is actually uh, a little less than if you were driving by yourself. That conversation between your friend when he's a passenger in the vehicle is much less distracting than that same conversation if you're talking to your friend on the cell phone. Oh, and it would seem like, I don't know, maybe the passenger could give you clues or help you navigate through traffic, things that the person on the other side of the cell phone wouldn't be able to do. Is that one of the reasons why it's not as dangerous to talk with someone in a car? Yeah, I mean, what happens is uh, when you have a passenger and they're an adult and they know the rules of the road, um, they'll adjust their driving behavior to uh, deal with different differences in, in driving demands. So if driving becomes risky or difficult, they'll stop talking. They might help the driver out if they're lost or if there's a hazard they need to avoid. So they're a second set of eyes um, that kind of have a shared situation awareness with the driver. Um, and so they can compensate for driving difficulty in a way that doesn't happen with a cell phone conversation. When someone's talking to you, if you're driving down the road um, and you're talking to them on the cell phone, they have no, diff no idea what the difficulty of traffic is like. Are you, are you driving through an area where there's a bunch of kids playing? Is it an open stretch of road? They don't know. Um, but if there's a passenger, they're well aware of it. And so depending on driving conditions, they'll change their conversation. And when you're talking on a cell phone, I mean, your eyes are on the road still, so you're still receiving visual information, but it's almost as if you'll see it, but you won't be aware of it. Does this tell us anything about sort of the nature of attention? It does. It actually creates a, um, a real good example of, of, of how seeing isn't just opening your eyes, that it requires attention to process information in the visual uh, environment. So in a number of studies that, that we've done uh, and uh, a large body of research just in general looking at visual attention, um, just looking at something doesn't mean you'll see it. Um, uh, Ulrich Neisser in the early 70s did a number of really excellent examples uh, looking at visual attention and, and showing that um, if you're paying attention to one scene and something else happens in that scene that's not relevant to it, that the, that the people wouldn't see it. And of course, um, Dan Simons uh, more recently has done a lot of work uh, and he's got a, a very a classic example of a gorilla that walks onto the screen uh, while people are passing a basketball back and forth and about half the people who are watching this video failed to notice a gorilla that walks into the screen right where someone's looking and, and beats its chest and then walks off the screen. So uh, there's an example of inattention blindness where people are looking, the image of that gorilla falls right on the retina of the observer, but they don't see it. In the case of driving, it's the same example of you're driving down the highway, the visual objects, the pedestrians, cars, and traffic lights and so forth are falling on the retina uh, of the driver, but if they're talking on a cell phone, 
um, attention is diverted from processing traffic related information and they fail to see up to half of the information that they normally would have seen as it normally would have been. In addition, uh, when you're talking on a cell phone there's kind of a, uh, an additional uh, restriction uh, in the way in which you scan the visual environment. You tend to look more straight ahead, um, not uh, scanning from side to side. And of course uh, an attentive driver uh, who's not distracted will oftentimes look side to side, look at the peripheral information, the side, mu side mirrors and the rear view mirror to, to basically build a more uh, uh, well-rounded um, uh, representation of the driving environment and have a, a high level of situation awareness. Um, and if you're looking just straight ahead, as uh, um, often is the case with someone who's talking on a cell phone, they will not be aware of the things in the periphery that could become problems for them. So this increase in accidents that you mentioned, uh, is this mainly from uh, statistical reports or have you actually done lab studies to investigate this? Well, it comes from a number of different sources and, and that's actually one of the strengths of the way in which uh, uh, researchers have studied driver distraction. So um, there are in fact uh, simple studies that you can do. Um, in fact, my son when he was uh, in his, his science project when he was in elementary school uh, was trying to uh, just do observational studies. So he and some of his class um, went out to uh, intersections around their school and just counted the number of drivers that approached uh, the four-way intersections, um, looked at uh, um, how many of those drivers were talking on a cell phone versus not, and you, so they could actually see that the driver was holding the phone to, his, to their ear, and whether or not they stopped. And they, they contacted the, the police department to find out exactly what the laws would have been and, and if a policeman had been in place there how they would have issued a ticket and what they found was that uh, people who were talking on a cell phone were about ten times more likely to fail to come to a complete stop uh, at these uh, four-way intersections around uh, elementary schools. And there are also uh, another uh, group of studies that are um, based on crash data. Um, they're epidemiological studies where someone's been involved in an accident and they get access to uh, the cell phone records, the researchers get ac access to cell phone records and try and establish um, what the relative risk of someone talking on a cell phone uh, has when they're, dr when they're driving. And those studies um, are some of the first to establish a, a crash risk that uh, um, is about four times greater than what you'd see when someone's uh, not distracted. Those two first types of studies, the observational studies and the, and the epidemiological studies, establish a real-world association. To be able to kind of take it to the next level, to be able to say that the cell phone is causing this increase in accident risk, um, we need to move into the driving simulator studies and my lab and a number of other study, number of other labs um, in the United States and actually across the, the, uh, the world have been looking at uh, the use of driver simulation uh, to understand uh, the relative risk of talking on a cell phone. So we'll put people into uh, uh, our driving simulator and it's a, it's a high fidelity driving simulator where um, you have the interior of a, of a car, of a Ford Crown Victoria. You have uh, the visual environment of driving with um, highways and city scenes and traffic lights and other vehicles just like what you'd see if you were driving. And we just measure uh, very precisely um, how well someone drives when they're talking on a cell phone versus not, um, how likely they are, they are to be in accidents, and we find a number of characteristics associated with um, someone who's talking on a cell phone. Their time it takes them to hit the brakes is significantly longer, um, and most uh, importantly with respect to the question you just ask, um, accident risk goes up by about a factor of four. So the epidemiological studies, the observational studies, and the laboratory simulator studies are all showing a, an elevated crash risk um, that's about the same level of impairment, about four times greater uh, than that of a driver who's not talking on a cell phone. Now in the, uh, this gorilla example you mentioned, uh, the tasks are both visual, so either not seeing the gorilla or having to count the basketball uh, passes, so it seems likely that there would be interference, but with uh, driving versus talking on a cell phone, you know, driving is largely a spatial manual task, and uh, talking on a cell phone, you have uh, auditory and verbal, and in some uh, accounts of resource theory, particularly the one popularized by Christopher Wickens, he sort of said that 
okay, with different modalities, there shouldn't be any interference, and you can't really get much different than driving and talking. So why do we still see this interference? It's a good question. Um, and to be honest, we don't have all the answers there. It probably has to do with the fact that uh, central executive attention is being overloaded, that you're basically trying to queue up two different kinds of activities, and that it requires kind of each of these to kind of the executive attention is required for both maintaining a good conversation as well as driving. And um, it's also possible that um, even when I give you a verbal task, that in some situations you may be representing uh, some of those concepts uh, that you're working with and manipulating verbally uh, in spatial imagery kind of uh, representations. And, so um, it may be the, that one of the reasons why we find this paradoxical interference um, is that language is a much more complicated task than we originally thought. And it's probably a little oversimplification to just say it's uh, auditory input, it's verbal coding, and it's vocal processing. Those are all true, but it may well be the case that substantial spatial uh, processing may be involved as well. Uh, as well as the fact that uh, in terms of kind of um, the frontal uh, regions uh, associated with uh, maintaining a task goal and being able to switch between one task and another, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, is probably a, a plays a critical role in, in, in both driving and um, in some aspects in, of uh, carrying on a conversation. And so you may be overloading some of the brain structures that are associated with uh, um, task, you know, maintaining a task goal and uh, alternating or switching between those more than one task. Have you done any neurological studies to really investigate uh, the brain and what's going on with the activity there? Yeah, we have. In the early studies looking at inattention blindness, um, we had people driving down the highway and we used an eye tracker so we knew exactly where the driver is looking uh, second by second or even much more frequently than second by second. So we knew if someone was looking at an object or a, a, um, a pedestrian or a car as they're driving down the highway. Um, and we then uh, have done a number of different types of tests. Some uh, would show um, a number of objects and say, do you recognize any of these things that uh, you may have seen while you're driving? And we know based on the eye tracking measures that people were in fact looking at some object, maybe it's a car or a pedestrian or a billboard. Do they have any recognition of it? Um, do they remember it consciously? And we find about a 50% drop off. So when people are talking on a cell phone, they remember or they can subsequently recognize only about half of the information that they normally would have recognized if they weren't talking on a cell phone. And we've shown this with traditional kinds of explicit memory measures where I say, which of these items, uh, one of these two items you've, you saw while you were driving, can you detect which one it is? Um, we've had people um, do recall measures where we ask them what they, what they remember. And we've also tested implicit memory measures where people don't have to be consciously aware or remember, ah, I saw this, but nevertheless, if they had paid attention to it previously, you can detect that. And then the last way that we've studied this that gets to the idea of looking at physiological measures of, of brain activities, we've recorded uh, uh, brain activity in the form of something called event-related brain potentials. There are snippets of brain activity, snippets of EEG, that are associated with processing traffic-related events. And what we find is that that brain activity, those event-related brain potentials, uh, are uh, reduced by about 50 percent. So the brain activity associated with processing things like brake lights or traffic lights uh, in the driving environment are cut in half when someone is talking on a cell phone. And what about uh, texting? Is that safer, more dangerous? Have you investigated that at all? We've begun to look at that. To, to be honest, in many cases, people say, why do you need to do research on this? Isn't it pretty obvious? <laughs> um, and I think that's a fair point. Um, if you think about it, when you're not looking out the windshield because you're looking at, at your uh, uh, cell phone and texting, um, you can't respond to something that happens out there. But in fact, um, sometimes to guide public policy, uh, you need to do at least some of the experiments, even if they are relatively obvious. So we've done some studies where we compare someone who's text messaging with that same person when they're driving without the distraction of text messaging. 
and those accident rates skyrocket. So the odds of being in an accident are eight times higher when someone's text messaging than if they were driving without text message, texting. So someone who's text messaging has a crash risk that's twice as high as someone who's driving while they're drunk. Is there any way to uh, practice away this impairment? Um, after a certain amount of time, do people learn to multitask? In this particular case, the answer is no. In general, there's a, there's a large literature on practice and skill acquisition and dual task performance. And we know that there are some characteristics associated with uh, um, the task structure that allow somebody to become automatic and be able to perform more than one task at a time. It requires a certain kind of consistency and regularity in the environment that allows the, the driver or uh, some pilot or uh, someone who's trying to multitask to be able to take advantage of that. The problem with using either a cell phone to talk or to text um, while you're driving is you've got two tasks that require attention. Um, driving isn't completely automatic. There's always some unexpected event of a traffic light changing, a child running across the street that requires attention. And no one has exactly the same conversation day in and day out. So you have two tasks that are attention demanding and so as a consequence you're going to get trade-offs between the two. If you have tasks that um, are more structured and you're consistently doing the same thing over and over and over again, um, you may be able to start to multitask those kinds of activities with less and less impairment. But that's not what we see with cell phones and driving. Those are two tasks that, um, to kind of use the jargon, are variably mapped or have variably mapped components to them so that they're constantly changing, constantly requiring attention, and you just can't become an expert at it. So that said, uh, we have done studies where we look to see if people who use their cell phone a lot are any safer than people who use their cell phone uh, a little. And it turns out that the crash risk is about the same. So people who use their cell phone about half of the time when they drive, and there are some people who are on the phone half the time while they're driving, they just are talking all the time. Um, don't show any uh, better driving performance than someone who uses it infrequently. And we've done other studies where we try and train people, give people lots and lots of practice, um, and the interference just simply doesn't go away um, in a consistent way. So that you simply just cannot practice away these two, uh, the interference that's associated with using these two kinds of activities because both are demanding attention. And so if you have a, a task like driving that demands attention or a task like talking on a cell phone that demands attention, you can't actually make one automatic. Um, that's just the way the tasks are structured. It, it doesn't allow that. Dr. Stray, thanks again for talking to us about your research and putting it into real-world situations. Glad to be of help.